You know those times when your child is just, well, completely overwhelmed. Maybe they're yelling about something that honestly makes zero logical sense to you. Oh, absolutely. Or they just completely shut down right after something upsetting happens. Exactly. And it feels like you're, I don't know, speaking totally different languages. It's really baffling as a parent, isn't it? Trying to connect and uh, the usual logical stuff that works fine for us adults, it just... It doesn't seem to land with them in that moment. And that's exactly what we're digging into today. We're um, exploring some really key insights from a chapter in The Whole Brain Child. It helps us get the why behind that kind of behavior. Yeah, and maybe more importantly, it gives us some practical ways to actually connect with our kids and you know help them navigate those really big feelings. So our mission here is to pull out the core ideas and uh, the actionable strategies from this chapter. Right. We want to give you tools, tools that are actually rooted in how the brain works, that can help turn those really tough moments into, well, chances for connection and growth, for real resilience. The chapter kicks off with a perfect example, actually. Thomas and his four-year-old daughter, Katie. Ah, yes, Katie. So Katie usually loved preschool, right? Drop-offs were fine. But then one day, she got sick at school. Thomas had to pick her up early. And everything just changed. Yeah, that's right. Even after she was totally fine, physically better, mornings became this huge struggle. Thomas talks about her becoming, like, heavier than a grand piano in the parking lot. Oh, gosh, yeah. Clinging on, doing that power lean at the door. And then the big one. I'll die if you leave me. Wow. I'll die if you leave me. I mean, talk about an illogical, you know, fear-driven thing to say. Totally. And Thomas was really struggling trying to figure out how... Just getting sick could trigger this intense kind of irrational separation anxiety. And not just how to get through the morning, but how to help her actually process it, right? To move past the fear. Exactly. And the book explains that understanding this really starts with looking at um, the basic structure of the brain, specifically the two hemispheres. Okay. So as you probably know, if you've explored these whole brain ideas before, the brain has two halves, right? A left and a right side. Yep. And while obviously they work together, they do have pretty distinct jobs, almost like different uh, personalities, you could say. Right. So tell us about the left brain first. Okay. So the left brain, think of it as the um, the detail-oriented side. Yeah. It loves order, logic. It's very literal. Literal, okay. And highly linguistic. It uses words, language. And it's linear, so it likes putting things in sequence. The book even jokes it likes lists and L words. Huh. Logical, literal, linguistic, linear. Got it. So the right brain handles pretty much everything else. Well, yeah, in a way, the right brain is much more holistic and nonverbal. It's taking in the facial expressions, the tone of voice, body language, the whole context. All the signals that communicate meaning beyond just the words. Precisely. It's where you process images, emotions, personal memories, kind of the big picture of an experience. So those gut feelings, intuition, those really intense emotional reactions we sometimes have, That's the right brain doing its thing. Exactly. The right hemisphere has more direct connections to the parts of the brain and body that actually generate our emotions. It's focused on the spirit of the law, you could say, the feeling, the context. Ah, as opposed to the left brain's focus on the literal letter of the law. Perfect. Like that example of a kid insisting, I didn't hit him, I just pushed him. Right. That's pure left brain literalness, totally ignoring the emotional impact the spirit of the situation. Exactly. And Katie's, I'll die if you leave me. That's yeah. coming straight from her right brain, that place of intense feeling and fear, not, you know, logical analysis. The book also mentions, and this is interesting, that really young kids, say birth to about three years old, they're heavily right hemisphere dominant. Yeah. They live much more in that emotional, sensory, kind of in the moment world, that why, why, mm-hmm. why phase that toddlers go through. That's actually a sign their left brain is really starting to kick in, trying to make logical sense of things, impose some sequence. That's fascinating. And the book includes visuals, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Showing the different modes. It does. You see the left side associated with things like math, reading instructions, logical steps. And the right side showing things like creativity, music, connecting with people, feeling emotions. Yeah more about the whole experience, it really highlights how differently they process the world. So, okay, we've got these two sides. They do different things. But the key, and the book really stresses this, isn't about, like, choosing one side over the other. We're trying to make your kid more left-brained or right-brained. Right. The goal is integration. Getting them to work together. Exactly. 
the brain is built for these two hemispheres to communicate and collaborate, connected by that bundle of nerves called the corpus callosum. We want what they call horizontal integration. The logical left talking smoothly with the emotional right. Yeah. Think about um, trying to row a boat with just one oar. Right, you just go in circles. Or the book's analogy. Trying to swim with only one arm. You might make a bit of progress, but it's super inefficient, right? Using both sides of the brain, like using both arms, lets you navigate life's currents much more effectively. And when they aren't integrated, that's where the problems start. That's when things can go off the rails. If the right brain is just overwhelmed, totally flooded with emotion, and disconnected from the left brain's logic, you get that emotional flood. Chaos, basically. Like Katie freaking out. Exactly. That's the state of chaos. Intense, often illogical feelings just take over. Okay, and what's the other extreme then? That's what they call the emotional desert. That happens when the left brain takes over and kind of walls off the feelings from the right brain. It becomes rigid. Rigid? Like the example of Amanda, the 12-year-old who acted totally fine after a big fight with her friend. Yeah, shrugging off, saying whatever, even though you could see, like, her lip trembling. Subtle signs of distress were there. But she wasn't letting herself feel it. Right. She was retreating into that controlled but very disconnected logical space of the left brain to avoid the painful emotions her right brain was actually feeling. That's rigidity. So integration helps us avoid those two extremes, the chaos of the flood, the rigidity of the desert. It's about staying in that flexible, healthy middle path, hmm. the river of well-being they talk about elsewhere in the book. Precisely. It helps kids learn to value both their logical thinking and their feelings, see them as partners. And it prevents that kind of unhelpful left brain literalness too, right? Like that hilarious story about the cake decorator. Oh, yeah. The person asked for JP on the cupcakes, meaning, you know, put JP on each cupcake. But the decorator literally wrote JP on the cupcakes across the whole cake. A perfect, if slightly painful example of the left brain following the literal instruction while completely missing the right brain's understanding of context and intent. Okay, so helping our kids integrate these two sides sounds pretty fundamental. How do we actually do that? The book gives us strategies, right? <laughs> it does. Two main ones based on this left-right understanding. The first one is called connect and redirect. Connect and redirect, okay. And this one is specifically designed for those moments when your child is right in the middle of that right brain emotional flood. Like Tina's seven-year-old son in the example. Coming out late at night, just pouring out this stream of complaints exactly about notes his birthday being months away hating homework just this seemingly illogical jumble of upset right and our first instinct often is to jump in with logic isn't it totally we want to reason with them explain why they're wrong maybe defend ourselves using our own left brain to meet their right brain flood which the book argues is usually completely ineffective at that moment all right because their emotional right brain is running the show. Your logical arguments, your left brain stuff, it just can't get through. It often just creates more distance, makes them feel unheard. It fuels the fire almost. It really yeah. can. So connect and redirect basically flips that whole approach. Okay, how does it work? Step one, connect with the right. So when your child is really upset, melting down, their emotional right brain is dominant, logic is offline for now. You have to connect with that emotional right brain first, using your right brain. So right to right connection, how do you actually do that? Well, it starts with acknowledging their feelings. Even if the reasons seem crazy to you, the feelings are real to them. So you validate that. Wow, you seem really upset right now. Okay. And crucially, use nonverbal cues. A hug, maybe holding their hand, using a really calm, soothing tone of voice, a gentle facial expression, just listening, really listening without jumping in to fix it or argue. Like Tina, is she pulled her son close, rubbed his back, spoke softly. Exactly, she just heard him. And the neuroscience insight here is that this right-to-right -right connection creates something called attunement. It helps the child feel felt. Feel felt, I like that. Yeah. And when they feel truly seen and understood in their emotional state, it actually helps their brain calm down. It helps them move towards a more integrated state where the left brain can actually come back online. Tina could literally feel her son relax as she just connected with him. Okay, so once they've calmed down a bit, they feel heard, they feel connected, then what? Then comes step two, redirect with the left. Now that their brain is more integrated, more receptive, now you can bring in the logic. This is the time for the explanations, the problem solving, talking about consequences, planning solutions. So after her son calmed down, Tina could then talk about the fairness issue, the notes, the homework, all that stuff, logically. Exactly. 
Connecting right to right first paves the way. It makes it possible to then actually connect left to left for that rational discussion and problem solving. You're using both sides effectively in the right order. And the book is clear, right? This isn't about letting kids off the hook for bad behavior. Oh, absolutely not. It's not permissiveness. Boundaries are still crucial. Addressing misbehavior is still necessary. But trying to teach a lesson or impose a consequence when a child is, like, emotionally drowning, it's usually pointless. It doesn't sink in. You need to help them get back on solid ground first. Right. The book uses a great lifeguard analogy. You rescue the drowning person first, pull them out of the water, then, once they're safe and calm, you can talk about swimming lessons or pool rules. Connect before you redirect. Rescue before you teach. That's the essence of it. When your child's overwhelmed by right brain emotion, connect first. That is such a powerful practical shift in perspective. Okay, what's the second strategy? The second one is called name it to tame it. Name it to tame it, okay. This technique is more for helping kids process difficult experiences after the fact. Scary things, painful things they've gone through. And the basic idea is that talking about it, telling the story, helps. Yes, exactly. When a big experience floods the right brain with intense emotions, raw sensations, maybe fragmented memories, retelling the story helps bring the left brain into the picture. How does the left brain help? The left brain loves order in language, remember? So it helps organize the events, put them in a sequence, make sense of what actually happened. Like the example they give of nine-year-old Bella and the overflowing toilet incident. Perfect example. She was terrified after seeing the toilet overflow, totally refused to flush it anymore. Her dad, Doug, used this strategy. He gently helped her tell the story of what happened, step by step. And just retelling it helped her get over the fear. It did, by recounting the sequence. Okay, so first the water started rising, then it came over the edge, then you called for me. Bella was engaging her left brain. She was creating order, using words. Mm -hmm. And as she did that, she was also revisiting the feelings associated with it, which are stored in the right brain. This process, integrating the left brain's logic and storytelling with the right brain's emotion and memory by naming what happened. It helped her tame those overwhelming feelings. So putting words in order to the scary, messy right brain experience helps manage it, helps contain it somehow. That's it, precisely. The right brain holds the raw memory, the images, the fear, the physical sensations. The left brain acts like the narrator, the sense maker. Retelling the story allows the left brain to impose some structure on that right brain chaos, weaving it into a coherent narrative. Wow. And research actually shows that even the simple act of putting a label, a name, on an emotion helps to calm down the activity in the brain's emotional centers. It's left-right collaboration in action. That's really cool. But what if a child doesn't want to talk about something difficult? You can't force them, right? No, absolutely not. Forcing it can definitely backfire. The key is gentle encouragement. Maybe you start the story yourself, hey, I remember when, and offer a few details, see if they join in. Or offer other ways. Yeah, definitely. Suggest drawing a picture about it, or maybe writing it down if they're older. Sometimes kids open up more easily when you're doing something else together, like drawing or driving in the car, yeah. rather than a direct face-to-face -face interrogation, you know? Less pressure that way. Exactly. Or even suggest talking to another trusted adult. The goal is just to find a way to help them engage their left brain to make sense of that powerful right brain experience. And this connects back to Katie, the girl with the preschool anxiety. It does. Thomas used this strategy too. He helped her tell the story of the day she got sick. He walked her through the sequence, getting ready for school, saying goodbye, feeling sick, the teacher calling him, daddy coming to get her, then feeling better at home. So he put the scary part in context. Right. He validated her fear. Yeah, that must have felt scary when your tummy hurt. But he wove it into the logical sequence of events. He also made sure to highlight the positive parts, the teacher helping, dad coming quickly. And didn't he make a little book about it with yeah, her? Yeah, he did, which is brilliant. By naming the events, putting them in order, acknowledging the feelings he helped her use her left brain to make sense of that scary right brain memory. It created a new, integrated story about that day not just the raw fear. Storytelling helps them master the memory instead of being mastered by it. Beautifully put, it empowers them. It works for little things like a skin knee and bigger things like the book mentions with Jack's biking accident. The parent acts as a facilitator, helping the child connect the facts and the feelings. It seems like these strategies aren't just for the kids though. The book talks about us parents needing integration too. Oh, that's such a crucial point. Our own level of left-right balance, our own integration deeply impacts how we parent. 
It's worth reflecting on, you know? Do we tend to get flooded by emotion, go into right brain chaos when things get stressful with our kids? Or do we maybe shut down feelings, retreat into that rigid, dismissive left brain mode, yeah. the emotional desert? Exactly. There is that example of the veterinarian mom, very logical, great at problem solving in her job. But she struggled with the emotional connection part with her son when he was upset. Right. She had to consciously learn to shift gears, to activate her own right brain first to connect with empathy to really hear him before jumping into her very capable left brain problem solving mode. And it made a huge difference in their relationship. It really did. It just yeah. underscores that one of the best ways to help our kids become more integrated is to work on becoming more integrated ourselves, balancing that logical side with the emotional connection side. Parenting with our own whole brain. That's the goal. Okay, so let's try to wrap up this deep dive. Uh. Understanding these two sides of the brain, left and right, it's really key to figuring out our kids' behavior, especially those big emotional moments. Absolutely. But the real power, the real growth, comes from helping them integrate the two, getting that horizontal integration going. Yeah, helping them learn to navigate life without getting stuck in the extremes, the chaos of being totally overwhelmed by emotion, or the rigidity of shutting emotion out, keeping them in that flexible, healthy flow. Mm-hmm that river of well-being. And we looked at two really powerful practical ways to help them do that. First, connect and redirect. Which means really tuning in, connecting emotionally right brain to right brain when your child's upset before you try to bring in logic or solutions. Connect first. And second, name it to taint it. Using storytelling, basically. Helping kids recount difficult experiences, putting the facts and feelings together, using their left brain to make sense of those big right brain emotions. These aren't just, you know, abstract ideas. They feel like real tools you can use to help kids build resilience, develop a more balanced way of being in the world. Definitely. And as we practice these with our kids, chances are we deepen our own whole brain capacity right alongside them. So here's something to think about as we finish up. The next time you're interacting with your child, especially if things get a bit tense, try to notice, are they operating from the letter of the law? that literal logical left brain? Or are they coming from the spirit of the law, that emotional big picture right brain? And maybe notice where you're coming from too. Right, just asking that question. Yeah. How might that awareness change how you respond in that moment? It's a simple question, but it could really shift the whole dynamic. Well, thanks so much for joining us for this deep dive into integrating the left and the right brain. We really hope these insights and strategies are helpful for you and your family.